eight. That was quite loud for me. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we are live now and we are recording and I see some of our participants beginning to flow in. So everything is just working well. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Hi, Julie. <laughs> and Julie, look at look at Mike and I. We're so professional now. We got some new <laughs> microphones. We're we're really we're feeling it. I got doubling down on the technology. On. <laughs> That's it. Nice, great. Well, welcome everybody who is flowing in. We're going to give just another minute or so as we allow some more participants uh, to join before we get kicked off. Great, people are coming straight in. Wonderful. Okay, so Peter, what time is it for you right now? Four o'clock in the afternoon. Four o'clock in the afternoon. You're living in the future over there, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Here it's uh, it's 9 a.m. and I'm in uh, Denver, Colorado, and it's a, a very blustery but beautiful blue sky day. And Mike is somewhere else. Where are I'm you, in, mister? I'm in Plano, Texas, and it's a Plano. blue sky, beautiful day here, too. Yeah. Nice. And a lot Peter, of you were, you were saying you were saying that you're having the typical uh, England weather, right? Well, yeah. And well, bizarrely, the sun has just come out now. It's stopped raining and the sun is coming out. It must be the effect of Texas, I think. <laughs> that's it just in time for happy hour because i assume when you yeah. get off of this call you go straight on to the fun stuff fun fun yeah great mm -hmm. oh thank you for the i think the, the compliments have got to be for me i'm surrounding myself with plants here paula there'll be more and more eventually i'll you'll find me on youtube and one of those people that has like a full jungle and i'm actually really excited my favorite garden center just opened up again for the season so don't tell my husband that that's where I'm headed later. Uh -huh. He's always like, more plants. Oh, yep. Send them over, Paula. I, I need them, and I actually might already be a part of some of them. All right. Well, I think we are in a pretty good way to get things kicked off. Hello and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kaylee Garrido, and I head up marketing and events here at Great Data Minds. Um, GDM is a collective of passionate data activists, and if you haven't already um, known us, we are on a mission to modernize the world of data. And we do this in two ways. The first is that we offer services around strategic planning, education, and the deployment of critical data projects, um, and that we also create content and host great events just like the one you are here for today. So a little bit of housekeeping. It seems like everybody is already very well equipped to be putting their thoughts, comments, and Facebook plant-related groups into the chat. Um, your cameras and microphones are off, but of course we wanna hear from you. So keep those conversations rolling in the chat. And if you do want to chime in with something, we can always unmute you or um, allow you to share your camera if you have um, a deeper question to ask. So today we are in for a treat because we have been joined by the esteemed Peter Jackson. Peter is a longtime data evangelist and practical hands-on leader. He's got a ton of experience in senior data roles and has delivered data transformations, built data teams and data operating models, and has a track record of innovation and leadership. He is a sought after speaker on the international circuit and he has co-authored the best-selling data books called number one, the chief data officers playbook. And there's a couple versions of that that's out. Um, this is actually something that we did with Peter's partner, Caroline Carruthers. Um, and I will drop that link into the chat if anybody wants to go and seek that out after. Um, and then today, of course, we are here to talk about the data driven business transformation. Um, and so Peter is the co-founder of Carruthers and Jackson, and he currently runs the CDO Summer School, which sounds so interesting. I'm so mm -hmm. excited by the idea of like recess or summer camp for adults. I just feel like, oh, we could go back and do that. And Peter is offering this specifically for CDOs. So this is a 10 week program. It's based on the books that we've just mentioned by Caroline and Peter, and it's made up of virtual seminars that provide hands-on instruction for next generation CDOs. So as soon as I stop yapping, I'm gonna get that link into the chat. So look for it there. 
Um, and of course, we have our very own Mike Lampa, who is our chief analytics officer here at GDM. Mike is a true transformation agent. He has been working with enterprises to modernize their analytics programs from the ground up. He's got a boatload of experience as an executive analytics practitioner, both as a consultant and as an employee in global 100 companies. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us today. And Mike, I'll turn the floor to you. Well, thank you, Kalia. Peter, how are you today, my friend? I'm very well, very well. It's great to be with you this afternoon, Mike, really. Is. Yes, yes, I was really looking forward to this um, fascinating book. Um, before we get into the book, I'm always curious, um, tell me, if you, if you will, tell me a little bit about the background of the people you uh, dedicated the book to. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting question. Um, well, um, Des and Aiden, um, they are Caroline's um, husband and son, respectively. Mm -hmm. And um, Jenny um, is on my side and she is my wife. And these three people um, have given us tremendous support for us to not only do our full-time jobs, but then to find time to write content and specifically these books. So it was very much a reflection of the support that they've given us through, through that process. Oh, how beautiful. That's awesome. All right. Let's get after it. So, Peter, chapter one, what is transformation? What is transformation? <laughs> well, for me, I think people band this term around too easily. If you go to a okay. conference, you ask the audience, you know, which of your organizations is, is on, the, on the journey to transformation, either digital or technology or data, every hand goes up in the room. So I think it's banded around too early. And I think that true transformation, if we're to understand it, is, is actually the the true changing in shape of an organization, the fundamental change in form of that organization and how it operates, how its business processes, and very often its outputs. Perhaps a disruptive force can yep. uh, be spawned from this, huh? Yeah. Yep. Well, it sounds daunting, uh, perhaps scary, yeah? yeah. <laughs> and, and you mentioned um, digital transformation. It's been incubating since what, the 90s, maybe? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think sort of even, yeah, definitely pre-internet, I think we were seeing what some people would call digital transformation. Uh, you know, the, the digitizing of processes, the scanning of documents and the storage of, you know, um, virtual artifacts. So in that sense, Yes, uh, it's been going on since before the, the birth of the internet. And even, you know, the, the local networking of offices, you could say, was, was an early form of digital transformation. So, yeah, certainly pre-internet. Pre so I would say early 90s, um, at least, yeah. And it, a revolution like this doesn't just impact the organization in a silo. Does it expand out to society as a whole? Massively, yeah. absolutely massively. And I think that... I think that we've all we've all experienced that transformation in our personal and social lives, and and the difficulty with that is, is that we expect those experiences in our office and professional life. Now, for mm -hmm. example, I'm speaking to you today on my phone, and and it's perfect, it's working brilliantly, and yet I might use something in the office, and I just think, well, my phone works better than that, or I can, you know, my phone is glitch free. And mm. what's the matter with our own internal IT and the way we do things? And, mm -hmm. uh, well, I can use Google and I can just search things and find things. Why can't I find things in our own data repositories and, and document stores in the office? So I think that we know we've all experienced that. We're all using um, data engines, now, whether it's an mm -hmm. Uber, an Airbnb, booking a flight, booking a holiday, whether it's you know, interacting with our doctor's surgery or, or whatever it is. We are in our personal and social lives we are experiencing that revolutionary transformation. Um, and I think COVID has made it happen even faster, even to the, to the extent of the demise of the call center and driving customers and clients online to interact with organizations and government even. Uh, and in the UK, we had the release of the COVID app. I mean, if the NHS, the National Health Service, had tried to develop that pre-COVID, it would have taken years and millions of pounds to develop, bang, almost overnight, there it was. So wow. we have, it, it, it's impacted society massively since, since the 1990s. Now we've all got home computers. We've all got home access to the internet. We've all got smartphones. So it's not only a workplace thing. It's not only a business thing. 
So if digital transfer information has been incubating since the 90s, why did it take us so long to start to read the signals of the potential? Right? Or for example, um, you quoted a use case around Kodak. I loved it. Can you share that a little? Share a little bit of that with the, with the folks. Yeah, I think I think what you're referring to there is that, that Kodak uh, invented, created the the digital image, um, mm. and and they they discounted it. They thought that it would disrupt their business too much, would almost send them out of business. So rather than embracing it, they stuck it away and didn't do anything with it. Um, and I think that. Therefore, to answer your question, why is it taking so long to incubate it? I think fear is a big mm. thing. A fear of, you know, we're good at what we do. Why would we want to adopt anything new? And then almost it's too late to adopt the new because somebody has overtaken you. The other great example everybody talks about, I'm sure you have had, had blockbuster video or video rental mm -hmm. stores in the US. You know, they kind of ignored what was going on with the, with the evolution of Netflix. And where are they now? And where's Netflix now? Yeah, so I think exactly. fear, I think uh, head in the sand, are going to be, I'm going to be quite bold here, things we would not want to talk disruption. I think it's senior execs who are kind of not aware of what is going on around them. They're not up to date with the technology. They, uh, I mean, I, I'll give you an example. I remember mid nineties, perhaps late nineties, I was having conversations with CEOs saying, look, you've got to have a website for your organization. And I actually recall some CEO saying, that's a fad. Everybody will get over it. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> and I think that those sorts of attitudes have, have led to that very slow incubation. I think there's other things at play. I think um, some of those may be cost to entry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think some of those, uh, I'm afraid, I would have to say around failed deliveries. Now, IT deliveries, technology transformations quite often fail or disappoint or overrun budget. And so I think we have decision makers who are saying, well, hang on. We've tried this before. It doesn't work, or I'm not. I haven't got any budget left for this kind of stuff. And so, you know, I think past failures have led to um, slow incubation. So, in the book, you also mentioned this is a data transformation, not a digital transformation. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, you are pushing me down into the controversial route here. This is, mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is, this is what I enjoy. For me, a digital transformation is where you uh, you start to engage with your customers in a digital platform, in a digital space. So you start taking online orders, or you start interacting with your customers through through a digital interface, whether that's on a phone or a website. What is really the transformation behind that is the data transformation, because you cannot have a digital online platform, whether it's on the phone or a website, without the data behind it. I mean, if you, if you pull up a page and it hasn't got your customer's account details, or you know, if it's a banking app and it doesn't have your latest balance and your transactions, it's not much of a digital interaction, is it? It's just an empty page. And so I think that the digital transformation is only as good as the data that's being served into it, but also yep. is only as, good that, that, as the data that is available there to transact with. Because we don't want to just look at data in our banking app. We want to make payments. We want to search it. We want to cancel standing orders or regular payments. We want to set them up. You know, we want to move money around. We want to transact with that data. So there you go. It's all about the data. So for me, the digital platform is kind of like the empty box. It's the crayons. You know, somebody's drawn a nice page. But it doesn't really matter how wonderful the imagery is or what color the buttons are or what the user journey looks like if there's no data there. So for me, I often see digital transformations stalling and failing because the data has been thought about too late in the process. And so I, my advice to everybody is think about the data first. If you, if you want to do X and Y for a digital experience for your customers, where is the data coming from? Are you going to be able to get the right data there at the right pace? Is it going to be good quality data? Are you then going to be able to allow the customer, the client, or the citizen to interact with that data as they wish to? Mm -hmm. All right. So what are the drivers around data transformation? You talked about like 10 hurdles. Can you expand on that a little bit? <laughs> um, well, I can talk very much from my own personal experience, what I've identified as the drivers for a data transformation. When, you know, when I've been uh, invited 
to join an organization as their chief data officer, very often the CEO or the exec committee or the shareholders or the board will say to me, this is what we want you to do. This is our drivers. And, and I think that there are a number of them. One is to deliver the business strategy. In other words, you know, if they have a, a business strategy, which is around uh, customer acquisition, then the data strategy, the data transformation, that is the purpose of it. That's the driver. But I think there's other more subtle things. I think that there's regulatory change. Mm -hmm. Often, um, you know, the data transformation is driven by regulatory change. Uh, a regulator or group of regulators may want to have better quality data. They may want to have data served in a digital format. They don't want to receive it in a PDF. They actually want to you know, receive it live, perhaps, through some, some form of portal or ABI or, or microservice. I think the third driver is uh, for, uh, for, for customer satisfaction or, or um, citizen delight. In other words, you want to use that data to delight the citizens, such as predicting next best action. Mm -hmm. uh, predicting propensity. Is this customer likely to do this next? Therefore, we need to be ready with X or Y product or service. Um, I think the, the third is customer service, is to, is to delight a customer with enhanced customer service. In other, in other words, so you want to have your data surfaced from your CRM systems, um, so a customer agent can serve that customer properly, either on the phone or in chatbot or in the digital experience. I think Another one is operational efficiency. I think a lot of organizations are after operational efficiency and they realize there's a huge amount of low hanging fruit that can be driven through data transformation. Get your data organized, use your data efficiently. You'll be sending, my example from, from my time in utilities, you'll be sending the right engineer with the right tools to the right pump in the right field rather than doing it over and over again because you've got the wrong guy with the wrong kit in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So you know, operational efficiency is very important. I think yep. then there is there is that kind of um, fear of missing out, the, the FOMO. A lot of CEOs or perhaps boards, ex-co's are thinking, well, hang on, our competitors are up to this. Perhaps we better have a go. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an element of that. Yeah, yeah. a little bit of a um, sense of urgency there. So driving yeah. the top line, so I get growth. Wonderful, because yep. growth is great. Um, taking out wasted costs so i improve the bottom line right um yep. governance of course you know we don't don't want to be set up for risk of million dollar fines right um and then uh, um, listening from within too right hearing the signals from the groups within ideas things that they yeah. want to do and yeah. very cool all right so who should drive this change and this transformation um well, I think fundamentally it should be driven by the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think a mistake we've made in the past is having um, technology strategies driven by technology. They should be delivered by technology. But I think that um, a data transformation should be driven by the business strategy and by the needs of the business, and whether that's operational efficiency or regulatory assurance or you know, growth uh, in whatever form that may take. So I think that it's led by the business. But I think that the 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 agent of change in that, the, the agent to bring it about is, in my mind, the chief data officer. Somebody who can understand the data from end to end, can understand the importance of data governance, of good data management, and then how to leverage the value in the data. In, in my experience, the business community tends to say, data, oh, that's an IT thing. How do we change that mindset? Uh, I think that that is, uh, I think that that's part of the data culture um, that we need to grow in organizations. So, so, the, so the stakeholders in the business can see that data is, should be partly their issue and their problem because they are the, or should be the data owners, but also that there is this new function called data, which is the chief data officer rather than the chief technology officer. Uh, again, no, do you want to be a little bit controversial? Uh, if the business is saying, oh, data is an IT thing, well, mm -hmm. there's something gone wrong there. Because if you ask most business people, you know, how, how's your data? How's it working? How's it functioning? Do you trust your data? They say, no, oh, gosh, no, we can't trust our data. We can't do what we want with our data. We can't get hold of our data. So therefore, if it is an IT thing, then it's an IT issue and it's not been fixed. And IT have had many decades to try and fix it. So therefore, 
there has to be a new agent to deliver that transformation. And be helpful. working closely. Yeah, yeah. Work, undoubtedly working closely with IT. You know, it'd be very naive and misguided not to realize there's a very, very close relationship with IT. Yeah, so building those relationships and trust both in the business community with the leaders all throughout the organization and with your IT partners. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah for me, absolutely. the chief data officer has, has, has one foot in each camp very much. Yeah, when I read through your books, the data chief data officer is a busy person. He's got to manage up, got to manage down, he's got to manage out. Um, so does data literacy come into play here? Massively, yeah. Uh, and I think data literacy is a, is a conversation which is, which is certainly, that on our side of the Atlantic, is growing. Organizations are wanting to understand what data literacy is, what it means. And I think that it's incumbent on organizations to increase the data literacy across the whole of the organization. It's not just analysts, it's not just the data team, it's not just that, you know, people are doing underwriting. It's every part of the business. We all in an organization have to understand how to look after data, how to understand data, how to interpret data, how to tell stories from data. I'm sure we'll come back to that later, right? But mm -hmm. you know, data literacy, if we're really gonna leverage data as an asset for an organization, and leverage the value within that data, data literacy has to increase throughout top to bottom, side to side of an organization. And a very good example, uh, beyond just understanding data, I often talk about the exec, you know, the people who decide where budget is going to be spent and why budget is going to be spent, increasing their data literacy so they can understand what it is a chief data officer or a chief data scientist is talking about, rather than it just being this, this gray area that they've heard of, but they don't understand and don't want to understand. You know, we in our roles have to make sure that we put it in language and understanding that the execs can make informed decisions. And that is part of data literacy. So that brings to mind to me, you know, like the other C-suite uh, roles and responsibilities, I'm gonna pick uh, the chief financial officer in particular, they look after the money asset. You mentioned yep. asset earlier in context of data. So the chief data officer, officer is looking after the data asset. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's um, something I used to do uh, at conferences sort of pre-COVID. So we're talking two years ago and I'm, I'm sure the picture has changed slightly a little bit. But at a conference, if, we was talking, if I was talking about the role of the chief data officer, I'd invite the audience to put up their hands if their organization had a chief financial officer. And of course, the whole audience would put their hands up. We've got a CFO. I mean, my time at LNG, I'd put my five hands up. We had five CFOs across the different parts of the business. And then I'd say to them, keep your hands up if your organization's got a chief data officer. And more than half the hands would go down. Mm -hmm. and so I then start exploring the question, well, if money in a business is considered an asset and you have a senior figure who's responsible and accountable for that asset, why don't you have somebody who's responsible and accountable for the asset that is data? Because we all talk about data being an asset, although those organizations who are on the journey to a data transformation. You know, they'll talk about data being the new oil or the new sun or the new water or the new whatever it is. They're referring to it as an asset that they're gonna get value from in some way, relating to the drivers we were talking about. So therefore it seems slightly perverse to me that you don't have a senior figure in the organization who is responsible for looking after that data and making sure that it's uh, good quality and available to the business and accountable for driving the value out of that data, that asset. I mean, we, you, have, you have chief HR officers who are responsible for the asset that is the people. Important effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I love, it. I love that whole leveling up though, because I, I truly believe in my heart, we can put a value around our data. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about that more. Um, so every company has got a data ecosystem. Some are incredibly complex, some are maybe medium complexity, but everybody has a data ecosystem. You talked to the concept of data triangles. Um, could you uh, share a little bit of detail behind the data triangles? Are you, uh, are, you, are you talking about what I refer to as the DICWA pyramid, the yep. data, yep. information, uh, knowledge, and wisdom? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, I think this is a, it's a simple but fundamental tool that I think helps that, that discussion 
around data literacy. It helps organizations understand that you're at the bottom of an organization, at the bottom of that pyramid, the triangle, you have raw data. And raw data is put together, perhaps you know, with IT, with data engineers, and it's made into information. In other words, you're, you're putting A and B data points together and you're getting C. You're getting uh, a piece of information from the, the raw data points, maybe way more complex than that. Then as you move up the triangle, you're then taking the information, you're making it into knowledge, and then you're taking it to wisdom. And that means that you, as you progress up there, you're moving from raw data points to prediction or prescription. And you can also map up the way, you know, you can map those various activities of data. You know, management information is, is a very low level activity. So that may sit low in the triangle and be around you know, information. You may then move up into business intelligence, which is around the knowledge and getting into prediction, which is around the wisdom. So I think you can use those tri that, that triangle or the DICWA pyramid, data, information, knowledge and wisdom in many ways to have deep discussions within organizations using a very simple framework about data. It brings it alive for people. They understand that the raw data, what the relationship of that is to knowledge. I'm picking up signals here as you're talking from data <clears throat> to information and knowledge and wisdom. Um, two things come to mind. There has to be some kind of enabling technologies there. And yeah. I need to have a good feel for the lineage. Yeah, huh? absolutely. Yeah, I, to move data up that pyramid, you, you need two things. You need technology and you need people. Right. And you need people with the skills to move it up that pyramid and to understand and be able to interpret it as it goes up that pyramid, mm -hmm. but also to govern it, as you quite rightly say, Mike, to govern the movement up that pyramid. So you understand that the raw data at the bottom, how it relates to the knowledge at the top. For example, how the raw data would, re would relate to a machine learning program or model that you have at the top around the wisdom. And one of those fundamental principles or one of those fundamental tools of a chief data officer is data lineage. Now, I fundamentally want to understand where my data has come from, where it's ended up, where it's been to on that journey and what transformations have taken place. And I think that data lineage is an artifact that data mature organizations should have. You should at any point be able to know where that data point has come from that I'm using to make a decision. The enabler for data literacy too, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I remember I, I produced, um, or my teams produced a um, uh, very complex data uh, lineage, a very visual data lineage mm -hmm. um, for Bloomberg data would bring into the investment management business. And I remember the front office, the chief investment officer saying to me, wow, it's the first time I've seen our data. And, and I thought that was quite revealing. Right. All right, so let's talk a little bit about adoption of change. Um, um, how, how, do we, how do we approach getting an organization to adopt change? Um, for me, that's almost tougher than, than actually doing the data piece. Because mm -hmm. I think that an organization has to be very, um, very honest with itself. Are they mm -hmm. ready for change? Obviously, Kodak wasn't. Neither were Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for change? Are we ready to embrace change? And are we ready to embrace change properly? In other words, are we going to get frightened as this starts to come on us and mm -hmm. either pull budget or pull people or stop it because it's, it's creating too many ways of making people too unhappy? That's an extreme. Mm -hmm. But I think to get true adoption, there has to be that, that very conscious mindset by the organization. That's not even the senior leadership. because We've all seen a new CEO come in and say, right, we're going to do this transformation. Whilst the rest of the army behind him saying, nah, we're not really up for this. Right, nah. yeah. So it has to be the whole organization has to be brought into what is about to happen. Mm -hmm. I think then that the organization has to understand that it's not necessarily going to be pain free. And are they really up for that pain? And, you know, they may have forgotten halfway through the transformation that they were ready for it and they made the decision. But boy, you know, 18 months in, it's hurting. Uh, you know, have they got the staying power for it? And then to make sure that it's truly going to transform the business. In other words, they're not kidding themselves. They're actually going to adopt changed business processes and possibly outputs as a result of the journey they've been on. 
What are the, the, some of the key blockers to transformation? We talked about the drivers, but what are the blockers? Oh, well, I think one of the biggest blockers is, is people, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, with, without a doubt. Um, and I think you've got to have your, your not only your senior stakeholders on board, you've got to have your, the whole people on board. Now, the people it's being done with, the people it will affect. As Caroline would say, you've got to win hearts and minds. You've got to, you know, not only win their minds that this is the sensible and the, the, the strategically important thing we've got to do. You've got to win their hearts as well. So the heart's not in it. They're, they're going to struggle with the change. So I think people are one of the biggest blockers. Yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting. I've in some of my roles, certainly at LNG, I had a communications team, a comms team in my data team. I thought it was important that we communicated constantly to the people in the organization mm -hmm. about what we were doing, why we were doing it, how it would be done, how it would impact them, to, to sing about the successes that they had brought about by the adoption of some of the things we were doing with them. So I think that people are a huge blocker. Uh, they're a huge enabler. And, and I, I have said uh, in the past, I've mapped my stakeholders. I've mapped them into, you know, the people who are going to be blockers and the people who are going to be my supporters and the people who are, well, we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. It's worth knowing who your stakeholders are and how they fit into that. Obviously, budget can be a blocker. Mm -hmm. um, have you got the money to do this? And I think that you really have to plan the, the finances and the budget of the transformation very carefully. Uh, and understand what level of investment or, or transfer of investment is going to take. Mm -hmm. You have to understand risk as well. Risk can be a massive blocker. And people say, no, this is too risky. We can't do this or we can't implement this because of risk. And I think that those, to me, are the, are the, are the big blockers. Yeah, gotcha. So this is a big, ubiquitous effort. How do you understand your starting point? Well, I think... Um, before you start on any journey, you need to know where your, your starting point is. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the CEOs I worked for, I remember um, she was relatively new there within the first few months. And she said to me, well, if we're going to embark on this data transformation video, A, I want to know how bad or how good it is. Where are we? How do we benchmark that? And how do we benchmark ourselves against competitors or like organizations in our field but how do we know if we've actually moved the dial how do we know we've had an impact if we don't know where we're starting from so i totally agree with her and so caroline and i in the book we put forward what we call a data maturity assessment we believe that the starting point is to do a data maturity assessment to understand how mature in, in a data sense your organization is because then you'll understand it will identify the important pieces you have to do first, where the priorities sit, which will focus that investment that we were talking about. It will identify skill shortages. It will identify behavioral problems or leadership issues. But it will also give you the model that we created, a score. And you will then be able to uh, redo that assessment over a period of time and see if that score is improved. So in other words, you can have a measure almost of your ROI or your progress on the transformation. So that maturity model and that score um, definitely influences uh, the strategy? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about the strategy itself a little bit. Is it just the IT strategy? Is it the data strategy? Um, I, or is it is it linked to business? Help me. Yeah. Well, it, a data strategy has to be absolutely focused on the business strategy. I mean, the data strategy is there to deliver the business goals and, and should be supporting that. But I think it would be very naive to think that uh, a data strategy exists in isolation because there should be, or there may be, a technology strategy sitting alongside it. And you have to make sure the two things work together and aren't going in different directions. I mean, a very simple example, it would be very easy for me to write a data strategy to say that we're going to move all of our data and analytics into the cloud and we're going to use a cloud platform for our analytics and our, our, our analytics data storage. And IT have got a data a technology strategy which is focused on-prem. You know, there we immediately have a very simple example of a conflict. So they have to be, have to be aligned. But I think they also... There are other strategies around organisations. There may be, you know, HR strategies around learning and development within the organization or recruitment, where you have to make sure your data strategy is aligned with that strategy as well. There might be a location strategy. And if they're looking to move 
know, out of London to a more provincial area, are we going to be able to get the right skills and people to deliver the data strategy? So the data strategy in itself is focused on the business goals, as is every other strategy, if they're good strategies. But you have to be aware of the ecosystem around you. What are the other strategies in the organization doing? And how do I dovetail with those? Where does uh, governance come into play here? We talk, we've been talking a lot about enabling business strategy, but is there a risk versus um, growth or you know enablement? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I interpret governance in, in several ways. I mean, obviously we have the, the very, as you know, us data specialists will talk about the data governance. In other words, have we got our data governed? Uh, and if we're going on a, on a transformation journey, then we need our data governed. We need to be able to know what data we've got. We need to know where it is. We need to trust it. We need to understand its quality. We need to know what we can and can't use it for. And we need to understand what we do and don't use it for. So you know, that's a whole data governance piece. Um, and that includes things like data catalogs, data ownership, data lineage, and you know, all those wonderful artifacts around data governance. But I think that's also the governance of, of change itself. And I think it's really important that the data strategy and the CDO and the data capability sit within the, uh, the governance frameworks for change within an organization. Um, you don't want to invent a, you know, the wheel again and create a new one. Um, you want you don't want to miss out on other change that's taking place and going through governance processes. So it's very important for me as what I would call a first generation CEO, you know, the first CEO in an organization. And the first things I want to do is to make sure that data has a seat in things like the technical design authority or the change management committee or the business design authority, because those are very important governance gateways for change. And then from a leadership and sponsorship standpoint, do you just need like one stakeholder? Well, one is better than none, but <laughs> I think that <laughs> I think that I would like to see a whole exco, you know, an ex an executive committee bought into to what is being proposed in the data transformation and the data strategy. Um, otherwise, I think you will have uh, doubters, you'll have naysayers. Uh, you'll have people who you're spending a lot of time and energy convincing, even when you're underway. So I think that in an ideal world, I'd want to see a, a broad reach of stakeholders who, who are brought into, who are bought into yeah. it and who are supportive. Gotcha. Um, yeah. What about the framework and the processes and tooling, right? We've been talking a lot about the people side of things, right? Yeah. Um, frameworks are very important, and I think we touched on frameworks a little bit, you know, about mm -hmm. those change frameworks um, and how policies fit into frameworks and those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, I think what I find particularly interesting is, is tooling. Um, has an organization got the right tools to support mm -hmm. the level of transformation you're talking about? And again, having been somebody who's been a first generation CDO and has started has been the agent of change in organizations. Quite often I see that an organization is lacking the tools that it needs to, to really go on that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's important to make sure that, that, the, that the right tools are in place, you have the right people with the right skills for those tools. Mm -hmm. I do say though that I wouldn't want to see um, technology procurement as a barrier to affecting some level of change and transformation with data. There is an awful lot that can be done by using the tools that organizations have. Yeah, it's just about you know, using them effectively, using them in a governed way, um, using them in the right way, but also making sure the data you've got into them is the right data and governed data. There's mm -hmm. an awful lot you can do without buying new tools. And you, you mentioned policies. Um, what makes for an effective policy set? Oh, uh, well, Caroline certainly majors on this one. Uh, a, a, a policy, a good policy is one that's usable. You know, it, 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 it's applicable. People understand it. Uh, they understand how it impacts them and why it's important, what they must and mustn't do. I think policies, you know, are, are big tomes, big volumes that sit mm -hmm. on a shelf. They rapidly become shelfware, mm -hmm. which means that they're not a policy. 
because nobody's nobody's referring to them. Nobody's is making use of them. So I think good policies are ones that work. I think Caroline uses the, uh, I think she uses her, or used to use her grandmother as sort of the, uh, the thermometer. And if my grandmother could understand the policy, then it's a good policy. There you go. <laughs> and uh, information security, or I'm sorry, uh, information risk. How does that come uh, into play? Yeah. Really, really important. I think, no, hmm. when, when data transformations are going on, it's incumbent on the CDO not to expose the organization to risk around mm -hmm. data and to understand those risks. And I think that if you have good data governance, in other words, you understand your data, you understand where your risky data is and what it is, you understand your critical data elements, I think that helps you to manage a lot of the risk mm -hmm. uh, and, and to mitigate risk. And certainly some of the things I've done, I've, I've interacted very closely with risk and compliance teams and financial services you're heavily regulated so working with risk and compliance teams has to be done and, and that comes back to the data literacy piece we have to educate those teams to understand what it is we're doing how we're doing it we have to educate them so they can understand risk perhaps that they've never seen before or see mitigations that they've never seen before i've worked with a, a colleague that focuses on uh, governance, risk, and compliance. And uh, uh, she had a brilliant term. She goes, do you know the black market value of your data? <laughs> yeah. Right? That was yeah. A, a good point, right? Um, yeah. So architecture's got to play into this, right? Massive. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that, you know, that is one of the 12 domains in our data maturity assessment, you know, is architecture. Does an organization have, a, have an architecture that is capable of supporting the sort of transformation the organization wishes. Now, if you think about that, does an organization have an architecture that's capable of supporting the business strategy? Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And that architecture may be, you know, how, how data is moving around the organization, how data is stored, how data is, is made available for analytics and reporting. You now, those things are, are crucial things in, in uh, the journey to transformation. And very often you see organizations with a very, very low maturity on architecture. You know, there's a lot of stuff that is legacy. There's a lot of stuff that may be out of support or about to go out of support. There may be a lot of redundancy in, in the uh, architecture. So understanding the architecture is important and having working with IT to make a roadmap that is coherent roadmap and a deliverable roadmap for, for that architecture. When we're looking at the organization and starting to figure out roles and responsibilities, because we're you know, we're surfacing a lot of roles and responsibilities people may not have thought of, do you have some tools you could suggest for mapping out roles and responsibilities for the organization? Um, I, I think that there are there are for me there's some fundamental um, roles and responsibilities in the data team that you have to have. And I think to, to, to a point you made there, Mike, absolutely right. The, these are new job titles that HR have never heard of, you know, job descriptions that they've never come across before. Uh, at Legal and General Investment Management, I had a head of data ops, I had a head of data governance, a head of data product and proposition. These, these are things that, that they've never heard of before. I think that modeling what the operating model looks like that's important and there's there's always a constant discussion between you know, do you have a, a federated hub and spoke model in other words a very small office of the ceo center of excellence with hubs going out to spokes in the lines of business where analysts and data scientists may sit or do you have a completely centralized organization where all of those analysts data science data governance sit in a big central office and I was talking to somebody uh, from one of our big newspapers in the UK um, earlier this week, and they were having this conversation. And I said, it, it largely depends on the data maturity of the organization. I think if you have a low level of data maturity, having a centralized team can accelerate your levels of maturity. In other words, you've got, you've got all of the troops in one place. You're starting to get people to do things efficiently in a repeatable way. You've got a centralized team which are beginning to grow out your data governance, your frameworks, your policies, your ways of working. And then when you reach a level of maturity, you can then move out and put those resources back into the business where they're working very, very closely with the subject matter experts. 
Um, so for me, one of the tools I would use to make that decision would be the data maturity assessment. Are we mature enough as an organization to support a really dispersed federated model? Hard to manage if you're not data mature. So we've we got a feel for our starting point, some of the key elements around it. I'm sure there's metrics that we're going to put in place because we want to uh, influence behavior and show progress, yep. um, contrib contributing to the trend value generated by a transformation. So let's talk a little bit about making change happen. What are some of the key elements there? I think the one of the first key elements is, is, is to do it, is to make transformation, make the change with the business rather mm -hmm. than doing it to them. I think one of the problems we've had with, with IT transformations uh, in the past is, is certainly if you talk to the business, they feel it's been very much done to them oh, we've been delivered a new HR system, or they're now making us change our email provider, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think that one of the, the big win, winning tickets is to do it with the business, make them feel ownership early on, uh, let them drive the change. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think one of, the, one of the things I think about, when you think about individual elements of the data strategy, perhaps you're, you know, you're delivering one piece of new technology or one new process based on, on using the data, is to, I steer away from proof of concepts now. I actually mm -hmm. want to develop MVPs, minimum mm -hmm. viable products, because <laughs> if it works, if it works and the business is getting value from it, you don't want to take it away from them. You want to scale that rapidly. Exactly. You want to scale out the MVP very, very rapidly so it actually becomes operational. It becomes significant and it's going to have change quickly in the business, which I think is very different to a POC, where you know, with a POC, you might need to go away and actually go through a procurement process. You know, why not do that early on? Um, so I think that... The, Delivering and adopting change is important. I think one of the key things, and we may be coming on to this in the discussion, is there comes a point where you realize that there isn't an end goal. In other words, what you thought at the beginning was your destination. If you truly adopt this transformation, you realize actually it's continuous. Now you've got to continuously transform, innovate, and change. And that what you thought was your goal is not the goal at all. It's just a way marker. It's a milestone on, mm -hmm. on a continuous journey. And I think some of the, the reasons for that is that as organizations, as they change their nature and they, they, they adopt and embrace transformation, there's, they realize there's so much more they can do. Their mm -hmm. aspirations suddenly leap. And they think, why are we thinking about only doing that? Now we can do this, 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 and this. I think the other thing is external environment. I think we'd be naive again if we didn't realize that technology is moving at a pace. And I think, you know, certain data specific technology is moving at real pace. So what you think may be achievable in 18 months time with the technology that we know of today, when you get close to that, you may realize, wow, we can now go so much further because we've got this, that or other technology that's come on the market that we can now deploy or the roadmap for the tool we were using has now developed and we can go further. So I think that, I think there's also that bit of the execs seeing the art of the possible and they start to understand what the future can look like. And so I don't think that, that it, it is a destination. I think it's a constant journey. So change is hard. We got uh, detractors from change. Um, how do we motivate people? Is it, you, you mentioned earlier, this is why we're making a change. Is that a function of coming up with a purpose that people can get behind? I think the purpose has to be very clear. And I think that, that the purpose becomes more compelling if you link it to the business strategy. If you can, if you can say, we are doing this because it's going to deliver more customers. And that's mm -hmm. what that's what our shareholders want or our investors want. We do this because it's going to enable us to do these functions more cheaply. Our operational mm -hmm. costs will come down. So linking the, the activities of the data transformation to the business strategy can be compelling. Mm -hmm. I think that um, an important thing about making it compelling is telling the story. In other words, don't, mm -hmm. no, for some like me, don't talk about machine learning and the algorithms you're going to be using and, and that kind of stuff. Talk about it in a language and a story that the organization can understand, and how it's going to impact operations, 
how it's going to impact customer service, how it's going to make it better for the citizen. Because I think that people understand stories so much better than we're going to do this machine learning over here because we're going to do it. Right, right. You know, the, the, something that struck me throughout the whole book, you, you referenced lean principles all over the place in the book, continuous <laughs> relentless pursuit of improvement, continuous learning, um, chase the value. I love that. Um, um, talking to the incremental nature of it, it sounds like there's multiple tracks that we can execute. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in all of our books, uh, Caroline and I have talked about what we would call a multi-dimensional data strategy. Uh, and I think in that book, we talk about uh, just an example that has three strands. It has the uh, urgent data strategy, immediate data strategy, and the target data strategy. Mm -hmm. Because we, Carol and I, have both experienced organizations where you have stakeholders who say to you, look, we fundamentally got to sort out the quality of our data. And yet other stakeholders, or more perversely, even the same stakeholder in a separate convers conversation, you say, do you know what? I want to be able to predict what our customers are going to do tomorrow, and I need that now. So you have this kind of long-term remedial action that you need to put into place. At the same time, as you're being asked to chase the value immediately, how do you put those two together? How are those conflicting demands? Because you, you don't want to make your hole any deeper. You don't want to make it any darker and build up technical debt or data debt, as we may call it. So having a data strategy that has different strands in it, different threads, so you can address jam today, immediate value today, at the same time as actually sorting out the fundamental data problems, very often around governance and management, you've got to sort out. Being able to blend those activities at the same time is what you really need to do. Otherwise, you'll just be going after that early value chasing the value stuff, and you won't be solving any of the, of the major fundamental problems around the data. In fact, you may be making them worse. Because we wanted to continually give, uh, keep the business actively involved in this transformation, uh, it, it hints that having a well-conceived self-service capability um, would be a key enabler. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Um, you know, delivering self-service to the business, that's what they want. That's what the business wants. I mean, mm -hmm. if you go and talk to an organization who, who, who would typically have low levels of data maturity, the business will say, we just can't get hold of the data we want. Or when, when we do get hold of the data, it's last week's, we need this week's. Mm -hmm. Let's turn the topic towards people. Our most valuable asset, I would suspect, in the organization, yeah. What do we have to do to enable the people to embrace this journey? I think, as we mentioned earlier, you, you, have, to, you have to tell a compelling story to them. You have to win their hearts and minds. And, and different people within organizations will require a different language. They will need different levels of technical uh, understanding. So therefore, you need to deliver the story in different ways. You have to show them what's in it with them. And then I think that beyond sort of the the data stuff or the technical stuff, you have to be empathetic. You have to make, you have to understand that these people are, are facing change, which may be frightening. Um, you have to make them feel comfortable with the change. You have to make them feel bought into the change um, because it is around people. And as we were saying earlier, Mike, you know, people could be your biggest blocker, but people will be your biggest deliverers as well. If you get people on side, you get them enthusiastic. If you upskill them, if you make them feel part of the change, in other words, you give them the skills, you give them the mm -hmm. understanding, you give them the support, rather than just saying, this is how we're going to do it and you know, get on with it. Mm -hmm. I think then you can get people on board because they are the biggest resource. Uh, they are the most important part of the transformation, without a doubt. You can, buy all the, you can buy all the shiny new technology you like. You can buy all the new data sets and data feeds you want. But if you don't get your people upskilled and on board, it won't work. That's right. So we've covered process in the form of methods and framework. We hit on people. Um, we have to do tools now. We did the two P's. We got to the I'm sorry? Sorry, I lost you there for a moment. Okay. I'm sorry. So we hit the two P's uh, that have an order of themselves, right? And uh, we didn't talk about the T's. So let's just talk a little bit about tools. We covered people, we covered process. Right? 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's the other triangle that I talk about, or Caroline and I talk about in the book, is people, processes, and technology. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, all three elements have to be there. Um, you know, conversely to what I said earlier on, you can have the, the greatest data scientists in the world in your organization, um, but if you don't have the technology, you don't have the platforms for them to build machine learning, then you're not going to get the outcomes that, that you want. So there is an element of technology and understanding what technology is needed to affect the change and the transformation that you're trying to deliver. Um, but I think that because it is a triangle and all of those three things work together, people, processes and technology, um, when you onboard the new technology, as I was saying a minute ago, you have to make sure that the people are skilled enough to use it and they understand that they're going to use this new tool and why they're going to use it rather than the old tool. I mean, simple example is, you know, getting people off spreadsheets. And spreadsheets is, is, the, uh, is the nightmare for every chief data officer who wants to govern their data. But you know, people in organizations feel comfortable with spreadsheets. They've used them for a long time. If you're going to introduce some technology to replace those and you know, perhaps automate those processes, then you have to have people bought into that and skilled enough to do it. Otherwise, they'll just revert to the spreadsheet. Talk and change, change, change a lot. What are the key elements for managing change? Um, I think one of those is is around leadership. You have to have good leaders to affect mm-hmm. good change. Um, and I don't mean that you know that's that. I don't mean people leading from the front with the flag. It's people who who the who the teams really trust. Uh, a leader who can explain in clear language to the teams what is going to happen. So I think leadership is, is, is very, very important. Um, and I think the culture of change, you know, mm-hmm. as we were saying right at the start of our conversation, Mike, has the organization got the culture for change? Mm-hmm. Or the appetite for it. All right. So, Absolutely. so we're arriving at the destination and our change, we're hit, we got to our first beacon on the horizon. Um, what are some of the key considerations when I'm running a business in, in this new data-driven, data-enabled world? You touched on um, a concept of D3. Um, it was actually a five-letter yeah. acronym, and you broke it down to D3. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, talk, we talked about it as, um, what we talked about D was because we, we, we wanted to introduce the term of dynamic dynamic mm-hmm. data transformation um, because it, it, in our minds it, it, it's not a destination it's something that's constantly evolving mm-hmm. and therefore we want to create this idea that, that the transformation is dynamic if we didn't have a beginning a middle and an end it was going to be continuous so, so for us trying to coin a new term which people could talk about to say well our transformation is dynamic we're going to use a d3 model um, I, as I say, it's important to find the right language for people to use to explain what it is they're trying to do. And I think that uh, when you've effected change and, and you're getting towards the end of your journey, being able to measure ROI along that journey, what is, what is your return on investment? Have you moved the needle? So we talked about having the data maturity model as one way that you could actually you know, have some metrics and some real semi-objective measures around have we moved the needle. Have we actually done what we set out to do in those 12 domains of data? But I think that you need to do things such as data um, value engineering. You need to actually try and very often around some of the transformation you've delivered, look at the, the dollars and cents. Have you actually delivered some, some dollars and cents of value uh, into what you've uh, delivered? Yeah, I, I do love the concept there where you said transformation has a start in the middle and people think it has an end, but the it actually has a start. The middle keeps refining, identifying a new end. And it's just milestones. I just love yeah. that. You know, so uh, I'm going to take a moment and see if there are any questions. Um, yep. Yes, we, a- we actually have some coming in right now. Um, we have a question actually earlier on, Peter. This is for you. It's from Lisa. And she says, do you have any suggestions on how to get the importance of data on the board's agenda? And I feel like you touched on this a little bit when you were talking about um, describing how it impacts the business, how it impacts the different business units, but can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, very quickly, I think I have three techniques for doing that. 
One is to align any data transformations or data strategy to the business strategy. In other words, link it so closely that the exec can't step away from it and they, they can understand how it can help them deliver the business strategy. The second technique I've used is around risk. Getting data onto the risk register actually really mm -hmm. focuses the exec's mind. In other words, do they really understand the risks that they are uh, approaching because they don't understand their data, they're not managing it properly. In other words, are they making decisions that are risky? Is their data security risky? Is their data governance risky? So getting data onto the risk register is very important. And the third thing that I've done to focus minds and get buy-in is to actually go after low-hanging fruit, go after some immediate business value, mm -hmm. show the art of the possible that actually shows some cash return and impact into the business. That really gets people listening. Yeah, that's right. Get them motivated. And then we have one more. Uh, see if we can sneak this in. Yeah. Uh, can you share some good references or guidelines or tools that could be used for the uh, data maturity assessment? You actually had some guidelines and tools in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can, and I'll be. Uh, I'll be very. I'll be very. Yes. <laughs> yep, I would get a copy of Data Driven Business Transformation, and there's a series of <laughs> chapters in there that will walk you through it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's great. And if anybody wants to get those books, you can go directly to Amazon, um, or you can go to carruthersandjackson.com, and they have some links that are available there. Uh, and I know we're right at time. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have one more question sneak in from Safdar. He says, the next question, could you please highlight how to obtain a value in terms of dollars of data? Mm. For, for data sets, um, if, if the question is around putting a, a dollar value on a data set, then understanding what that data set is used for and what revenue it drives or what mm -hmm. costs it's mitigating or what business it's retaining. Um, I would, for any data value, I would try and understand what that data is used for and what the commercial impact of that data is. Yeah, and, and I'll add to it, it's critically important when you're driving out your analytic requirements that you have a definition of value built into that requirement. If, if I, Get this analytic as a stakeholder. Yeah. I can make these decisions and I'm committing to generating value back to the organization, either through revenue or cost takeout. Great. All right, All right. well, that, uh, that brings us right to the top of the hour. So thank you so much for this conversation, Peter. This was fantastic. Um, just a, a, rec a reminder yeah. for uh, everybody listening in that if you want to have more information about Peter's summer school program, you can go to carruthersandjackson.com um, and there you'll find more information about this 10 week uh, virtual seminar that mm -hmm. is going to be held uh, specifically for the next generation of CDOs uh, coming up over this summer. Um, and then from the great data mind side of the house, of course, we're always so thankful for everybody who joins us. We would love to um, invite everybody to join us for our next uh, session, which is going to be happening in just a couple weeks. It's a thought leadership session with Matthew James Bailey. He's going to review the ethical implications uh, that surround ungoverned AI. So a little bit of a change, but another great session. So thank you everybody for uh, joining us today and we wish everybody a great day and Peter for you, a great evening. Yes, Peter, thank you so much, sir. It was awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>